At approximately 12 a.m. on January 5, 2006, an unknown woman in glasses and a white coat standing at the entrance to the Sago Baptist Church in Buchanan, West Virginia, received a telephone call. She listened to the message, then hung up the phone and turned to the people at the church. They had been there for 40 hours desperately waiting to find out the fate of their husbands, sons, and fathers that were trapped two and a half miles in a gas-filled mine. They found them and they're alive, the woman said. They're all alive, all of them. The miracle they prayed for happened. 12 of the 13 miners trapped after an explosion at the Sago mine in West Virginia were found alive. The crowd erupted in jubilation and celebrated the miracle for the next three hours until an official statement was released. The earlier report had been wrong. This is the Sago Mine Disaster. On January 2, 2006, a man peered into the side of his hard hat. He was looking at a label. The label read, Barricade yourself to block out toxic fumes. Listen for signals from outside. Signal by pounding roof bolts. Rest 15 minutes, then repeat. If you hear five shots, you have been located and help is on the way. He had a decision to make. Continue searching for an exit in blackout conditions with oxygen in his air tank running out, or find a pocket of breathable air and barricade himself in and wait for help. This miner was the most senior of a group of 13 that were trapped two and a half miles from the main entrance and 280 feet underground. The air in their self-rescue devices was running low, and any exit was impossible to find through the thick smoke. The miners decided that getting out themselves was impossible. They moved to the back of the two-left section of the Sago mine and draped a curtain to barricade themselves in a 35-square-foot pocket that would be their home for the next 41 hours. Just a few minutes earlier, at approximately 6.30 a.m., they had been traveling along a railway in a mine trip, a cart that carries miners down to the excavation site by rail. But they weren't the only miners. There was a second cart carrying 14 miners that was traveling behind them on the way to one left section. On the way to their separate sections, a pocket of methane exploded between the two groups, separating them with debris, thick black smoke, and poisonous gas. The one left group was showered with debris, many thinking that their life was over in that instant, but they all survived and luckily were on the exit side of the blast. The two left group was on the opposite side of the blast and they were trapped. After the blast, thick smoke and carbon monoxide filled the mine. The men of one left section had no choice but to immediately run for fresh air. When they got to the fresh air, they began discussing how they would get back to the other men. The miners evaluated the situation and left for the exit knowing that there was no way to get back to their friends. Owen Jones stayed in the mine with a few others as his brother Jesse was in the two left group and was trapped by the blast. But they were blocked by thick smoke and debris. After thoroughly seeking a way through, it was impossible. They had to turn back, not knowing whether the other miners were alive or dead. 90 minutes after the blast, at approximately 8 a.m., the mining company contacted a rescue crew specialized in mining accidents. They also contacted the Mine Safety and Health Administration, or MSHA, at 8.30, a full two hours after the blast. The MSHA is a federal mining safety regulatory agency. They arrived on site at 10.30 a.m. and the rescue crews arrived shortly after, but couldn't enter the mine. Smoke was still billowing out of the entrance, and air testing revealed that carbon monoxide levels were increasing. This was an indicator that a fire may still be ongoing in the mine. If that fire came into contact with explosive gases, such as methane, another explosion could occur. They couldn't risk placing other lives in danger with such high potential for disaster. At this point, the rescue teams began setting up for drilling into the mine two and a half miles away, above where they believed the miners were trapped. However, it would be another 12 hours before they would get the all clear to search for the trapped men. 12 hours after arriving, the carbon monoxide levels stabilized and the rescue teams were cleared to begin their search. 
but the rescue attempt was agonizingly slow. As the teams trekked through the mine, they continuously tested for dangerous and changing conditions. They checked for water steeps, explosive gas concentrations, and potential roof collapse. Their rate through the mine was 1,000 feet per hour. Every 500 feet, the team would connect a phone to the lines installed in the mine and check in, then would disconnect and continue on. This was a heart-stopping procedure, as any spark could ignite methane in the mine shaft, causing another explosion. After searching the mine for nine hours on January 3rd at 3.40 a.m., the rescue team was ordered out of the mine. High concentrations of methane were found, and they were preparing for drill tests. Near the roof of the mine, the drill bit was about to enter the mine shaft. The drill bit was hot and could cause another explosion, so the rescue team was extracted before penetration of the bit into the mine. In an attempt to locate the miners, they drilled two holes and ran cameras, microphones, and sensors down the holes. They didn't find any signs of life and found that the carbon monoxide levels in the air were 1,300 parts per million. 200 is considered unsafe. Deep in the mine, the workers' self-rescue devices had long since run out, and the miners were struggling to breathe. In the event that they wouldn't make it out alive, many of the miners wrote messages to loved ones. The air is bad. I don't know how long we can last. Time is running out for us. We have not heard anything from the outside. If someone finds this, please give this to my wife. I love you. We have air right now, but the smoke is bad. Tell my mother I love her and kids. Love, Dad. Two and a half hours after exiting the mine, the rescuers returned at 6.22 in the morning. The air deep in the mine was toxic, but the rescue team knew that the miners would have followed procedure and barricaded themselves from the toxic fumes. There was still hope, and these rescuers were determined. The rescue team searched the mine while the miners' families waited anxiously at the nearby church. They searched the mine, communicating back every 500 feet until 5 o'clock that afternoon. After 10 and a half hours, they finally found something to report a body. The body of Terry Helms, the fire boss, was found. He was not in the same location as the miners, so there was still hope that they would be found alive. Just before midnight on January 3rd, the rescue team two and a half miles back in the two left section heard a moan and wheezing and followed it to a rough barricade structure. Upon finding the barricade, the rescuers were excited and nervous. They knew when they pulled back that tarp, they were either going to find miners celebrating and embracing or lifeless bodies. Slowly, one of the rescuers pulled back the barrier and peered into the small 35-foot area and heard a wheezing breath coming from inside. He saw the miners lined up, leaning against the wall, almost as if they were on break. He was immediately overcome with excitement as he shouted, they're alive. This message was then transmitted to the clear air station, then relayed to the command station above ground. The rescue team then checked the bodies to realize that only one man was alive. 12 of the 13 miners were dead. Randall McCloy was the man alive. They immediately administered oxygen and began preparing him for removal. The rescue team transmitted back, we have all miners accounted for, we have one alive, and we need help, and we need help now. However, due to the intermittent radio connection, the first part of the message was not received above. Only, we need help, and we need help now. The message was interpreted that the miners were alive. The message without verification was relayed to the church. The families believed that their loved ones in the mine were found alive and celebrated. As the family celebrated, another rescue team quickly went down the mine shaft to assist in bringing up the miners, which they thought were alive. It wasn't until they reached the barricade that they realized everyone except Randall McCloy was dead. The message was then relayed to the command center. They do not release this message before verifying it. An hour goes by, then two, while the families wait to see their loved ones. The jubilation turned to worry when 15 police cars showed up and Ben Hatfield from the ICG began to read an official statement that only Randall had survived. The happiness turned to blame, sadness, and anger as all families but one now knew that their husbands, fathers, and sons 
were gone. McCloy and the 12 bodies of the other miners were retrieved from the mine. Because McCloy was found alive, we have his account of what happened during those 41 hours. This is his story. Two and a half miles deep inside the mine, once the men tried and tried to find a way out, but every time they searched, they ran into a thick smoke and debris that blocked their path. Not finding a way out, they resorted to the procedure that was provided on the inside of each of their hard hats. Barricade and listen for rescuers, signal rescuers by pounding on the roof bolts, then rest for 15 minutes and repeat. According to McCloy, they signaled for several hours, but stopped when they were getting tired and using up too much oxygen. With the carbon monoxide filled air, they simply weren't getting enough oxygen to continue exerting that much effort. As the men sat and waited hours on end for the rescuers, the air behind the barrier became worse and worse. They were all getting dizzy and began to accept that they weren't going to make it out. Toller and Anderson, two of the miners, tried again to find a way out, but the heavy smoke and fumes forced them back. Toller then led the men in the sinner's prayer. Then, one of the miners suggested writing letters to their families. They passed around paper and pencils and began to write, Anna, I love you so much. To my son, trust in the Lord. To my daughter, stay sweet. I am not that afraid. Don't grieve long. The fumes are getting terrible, but everyone is still partially okay. One by one, the men passed out, then died, while the others watched, knowing that there was nothing that they could do and that they were next. McCloy remembered speaking to Jackie Weaver last before he passed out. When McCloy awoke, it was January 25th and he had been in a coma for 21 days. He was in the hospital and only remembered bits and pieces of what had happened. While in the coma, he had been placed into a hyperbaric chamber where he received infusions of oxygen to counteract the carbon monoxide effects. He was suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning, a collapsed lung, brain hemorrhaging, edema, muscular injuries, a faulty liver, and improper heart function. Through intensive rehabilitation, he regained his ability to walk and talk, but still has vision and hearing impairment and weakness on the right side of his body. Three weeks before the explosion, the sole survivor, McCloy, and one of the deceased miners, Junior Toller, were drilling a bolt hole that opened up to a methane pocket. They informed their superiors, and the next day, McCloy found the hole had been filled with glue. On the morning of the blast, there was a significant thunderstorm with bolts of lightning striking the ground all around the mine. It is believed that one of these lightning strikes ignited a methane pocket above the mine causing the explosion and trapping the Sago miners. Media outlets and investigators blame the MSHA for laziness and lackadaisical mining regulations and oversight. The MSHA stated that these allegations were unfounded and cited 18 times that sections of the mine were shut down for potential danger and were only reopened after the danger was eliminated in 2005 the year before the accident. Regardless of blame, many additional safety regulations have been implemented on both the state and federal level since the Sago mine disaster, including requiring additional air supplies, requiring communications in the mines, and tracking devices, as well as lifelines that miners can follow in low visibility conditions, training miners in evacuation techniques, and mandatory notification of any accidents to the MSHA within 15 minutes of the accident. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.